Hello, everybody. First of all, let me tell you some, some words from the organizers. Uh, this talk coming before mine talk was actually not a replacement for a speaker, but in every TED organized event, there must be an official TED talk played to the audience. I'm actually the replacement for the speaker that is, <laughs> that is missing. And you know, this gives me a good excuse for a starting point because I actually prepared this presentation this morning and you know, speaking after a Harvard professor in one of the best TED Talks gives, let's say, puts, puts a bar pretty high. So just to lower down your expectations a little bit. Well, let me start by saying that first of all, I don't believe that there is such a thing as the turning point. And I will be talking about turning points in my life. And I won't be talking about the finance, and most of you who are actually students at EPS, at least some of you are students at EPS, know me as a finance professor. So don't be afraid, I want there will be no equations in, 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 in the presentation that I, will, that I will show you. And it will be a very personal talk. So let's start actually with my birth. I was born in 1978 in a country that doesn't exist for a period when most of you have been born. So this country did exist for most of the 20th century, but it doesn't exist anymore. So I was born in Yugoslavia or in part Croatia, in, in a part of Yugoslavia called Croatia. Now, this was a country that was a socialist country basically behind the Iron Curtain, but I would say much better than most of the countries behind the Iron Curtain. But you know, there were some things that we were exposed to, like for example, one thing that was a turning point in my life was actually watching the movie War Games with a little kid trying to hack into some big system and playing war games with actually a real defense nuclear system. And I was really into hacking as a kid, but you know, behind the Iron Curtain, computers were not something you could walk into a store and buy. It was not a widely accessible thing. But then the group of enthusiasts in ex-Yugoslavia actually published a plot, a design of a computer system that everybody could build. It was called Galaxia. It was a computer that you could literally build yourself if you followed the instruction. And this is how we all basically started back then. We were building our own computers from, from, the, from the sketches. And actually, you know, this story gives you a bit of a component from my life. First of all, I was a computer geek from the start. Second of all, it's not that I was building my own computer back then, but also I started to create per first software that I actually tried to sell. So back then in 1988, when I was 10 years old, I wrote a computer program for a phone book and managed to sell it to some law firms. So this is how it all started and will give you kind of a repetitive thing that we see both in people's life and and, and in the world that we see. But then, you know, things started to cook up and, you know, this country started to dissolve in some very, very bloody and heavy wars. It first started with Slovenia and Croatia becoming independent states and Macedonia, and then, you know, it fell apart. It fell apart completely. And this was a turning point in my life. And my family, even though we were born in Croatia, was a very mixed origin. So I couldn't say that I was from this part or that part. We were of a very, very mixed origins, just by pure chance living in Croatia. So basically in 1993, we were living in a little town in Croatia. And these were the photos from that town when in 1993, uh, basically, however you wanna call it, Yugoslav or Serbian army, throw some rackets and bombs on this city. And you know, I was in part Serbian, so I was in part all kind of things. And I was basically, I had an opportunity to run away from rockets and real bombs falling on the city. And I clearly remember this day, I was on the streets and I was literally running away from the rockets falling on the streets of this city. To make things even more complicated, two years later, my father got invited to join Croatian army. But there was something very specific about this invitation, and you cannot really understand it unless you speak Croatian or Serbian. Some people would say different, I would say the same language. Is that he was supposed to report to become a member of reserve staff of Croatian army in a place which is actually a slaughterhouse. So 
this was a tricky invitation, and my father decided not to actually go into dessert. And uh, even though he used to live in the U.S. and his sister used to live, is, and is still living in the U.S., he couldn't go there because you know police was searching for him because he was hiding and didn't want to report to Croatian army. So my own family, basically the only place where we could go was actually Serbia without a visa because back then it was complicated. And my mom actually, police took over her passport and she had to stay in Croatia. And I'm saying, put, put the things in perspective. For a little kid, everything was confusing. And it was very much confusing. First of all, you know, I come from a mixed origin. First I ran from Serbian rockets, then Croatian army is chasing my father. So all thing creates lots of lots of confusion for uh, basically, you know, I was, f when all things started, I was 12, 13 years old, and back then I was 15 years old. So I moved to Serbia in 1993, and the situation in Serbia in 1993 is really, really, really difficult to explain. So put the things into perspective. There is a war basically between, I don't know, you know, it's difficult. Everybody was fighting everybody. So it's difficult really to go into details in, in 20 minutes. But Serbia was on top of that under UN sanctions. And on top of that, it was ruled by a crazy autocratic dictator Milosevic. And they had basically even, or a tool that was used to basically take money from people was hyperinflation. They were printing money like crazy and basically you receive your salary check and next day it's worth nothing. I mean, people in Germany have experienced that after the World War II, this hyperinflation times, but you know, that's way back. I experienced that personally. And put the things into perspective that the average salary back then on the next day would be worth approximately 2.5 euros in nowadays terms. So. Well, then another turning point took place is that actually, even though we had the status of the refugee, both my brother, my father and me, and my mom was still in Croatia back then, my father was arrested on the streets and sent into Serbian army. He managed to, 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 to run away, so he was basically sought after both Croatians and Serbians for not joining any of the sides in the war. And then, I somehow decided, you know, to synthesize happiness, and then I started to work for a newspaper, probably one of the very few opposition newspapers that was fighting this system of, of autocratic Milosevic government in Serbia back then. And I remember clearly, in, in 1994, I was able to earn approximately, in nowadays terms, 7.5 euros. And for these 7.5 euros, I was able to buy myself a burger per day. That was a big success. You know, I was living in a foster home, basically, because my father was, my father was basically arrested. My mom was in Croatia. And I was living in kind of a public foster home. And this was 1993. Basically, everybody was poor. Even people living with their own families were poor, not to mention people living in foster homes back then. You know, we were literally eating bread, which is old five days, and if we were happy. Now, then, but in this whole crazy situation, there was a, there was almost a little oasis in the middle of nowhere on Serbia called Petnica Science Center. It's kind of a geek camp. This is where talented kids interested in science would gather and do all kinds of things. I was, for example, doing uh, experiments in astronomy, which led me later to graduate in astrophysics. And my wife, who I met there basically in high school, she was a bio biomedical scientist that currently is a cancer scientist here in Germany, in America. And this whole experience, this oasis of, let's say, normality in a crazy system, led me to meet a bunch of super interesting people. And among these super interesting people, I meant some people at the Institute of Physics, and we actually built the first supercomputer back then, and we are putting this into perspective. This is 1993, 1994 approximately. We built the first Bell Wolf cluster. This was the first supercomputing device back then in the region. It was small, it was for any standard small, but the technology used was the same technology used as in top supercomputing platforms back then. Now, you know, the things didn't settle, you know. Even though I had this oasis of peace, another thing started to happen. So basically, 1995, 
Croatian army decided to basically expel the Serbian military from Croatia, one could say justfully, but in the process they also expelled all Serbian population basically living in Croatia and basically creating an ethnically cleansed state. And with this population, my, one of my grandfathers was also forced to leave. And to make situation even more crazy, Serbian police pushed him down, wanting him to move to Kosovo because they had an intention to create an ethnically cleansed Kosovo. Luckily, they didn't succeed at the end, and you know, we managed to keep my grandfather. Uh, but now let's put things into perspective. Let's create synthetic happiness in the world of craziness that surrounds you. This is a page of Yahoo in 1994. Internet was just starting. There was no Google. You, most of you probably don't even remember time before Google. You couldn't search internet. There was only one page with 31,000 links, and this was from the good times of Yahoo. Yahoo, when started, had maybe 100 links. And you couldn't really search internet. You could try different websites, and that was basically it. And back then, when Yahoo started, so a little bit before that, I actually had a larger collection of links than Yahoo did. <laughs> and I wanted to create, create my own Yahoo, but you know, I mean, put the things into perspective. <laughs> Having a web server in, in Serbia in the 1990s was not really that easy to achieve. But nevertheless, I was a crazy kid. And I decided that I should somehow fight the system that is creating a crazy environment. And in 1996, I thought that actually the villain that is helping the back then Serbian government to stay in power was internet. And then this is, this is actually an article from the New York Times published in 1996, and the interview was actually done somewhere in the 1995. And I said the following. The internet is a dehumanizing addiction and the greatest single threat to human civilization. Fortunately, the people who rule Serbia do not understand these dangers. Otherwise, they would help it grow. And I end up, if we can't make wires for Unix, we can always cut the optical cable. This is my mission in life, to save the world from internet. <laughs> so, okay, I fought the war, but the internet won. And this is the, the reason how you actually, <laughs> many other people will be able to see, many other people will see this video. And of course, you know, to bring down, uh, to bring down a crazy dictator, it was not enough to create a, one of the first computer viruses. And actually, if you Google carefully, you will find this in like two or three history books of internet as a, one of the first viruses that successfully spread out through internet. But you know, actually, what what brought down this 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 let's say a dictatorship was actually first he had to lose the war against the NATO, and then later people had to go down into streets, and not me creating a computer virus in a country where the internet penetration was far below one percent in the early 90s. <laughs> but then I started having some business idea in this crazy environment. And this crazy environment was as crazy as, you know, copying and pirating CDs was a standard. It was a norm. There was no, you, you know, you couldn't walk into a store and buy Microsoft Office. Nobody was buying Microsoft Office. You would just copy it. It was actually imp impossible even to import because of the UN sanctions. But then, you know, for local software developers, the big problem was you develop a software and then everybody copies it and you basically cannot succeed as a software developer. So I had an idea to create a copy protection system. And copy protection system essentially was super simple. We drilled the hole with a laser in a CD disk. And then you ask from your computer program to work to have a hole in a disk in a very specific place. So that it's very difficult to replicate. And we actually succeeded, and then we went to some venture capitalist competition in the 90s in, in, at UC Berkeley, and we went into finals, but it turned out that this was actually patented by somebody like a few years ago, even though nobody ever, ever used it. But this whole thing, you know, brought me, and, you know, meeting all these people, all these smart kids and people in this, 
geek camp together with this CD brought me into the opportunity to actually to study s at some of the best universities in the world. And this opened many, many doors to me. And as you know, then in 2009, another big turning point out of the turning points was when I came here to Germany and took professorship at EPS. And also in 2009, this little, little guy was born. Now, what? Let, let me try to kind of score at the end somehow. You know, if you observe, if you observe the progress of my life, well, you will see some cyclicalities in a sense. I created first a software for a basically phone book that I was selling, probably in the worst place that you can at that point in time on a planet. You know, you're trying to sell a computer software in a communist country. It's not that easy, I can tell you. And you are 10 years old. <laughs> but, you know, all this thing brought me to creating a risk management software. And basically, you know, some of the risk management algorithms, credit rating and scoring algorithms that the company that I created later that I don't want to advertise, basically is used by some of the largest banks in the world and by some of the largest fintech startups in the world. If you observe this supercomputer that we built, it was basically built using the same technology or a very similar technology that allowed me later to use one of the most beautiful and powerful supercomputers in the world that helped me do research on which I'm working now and that led me to basically to get the professorship. Now, you know, if you would go back in time in history even more, well, you know, this little guy over here, that, that, that's my grandpa. He came from even more privileged setup than I did. I came from a privileged setup in the next Yugoslavia, which then later got disturbed. But my grandpa came from even more privileged in the early 20th century. You know, they were one of the, I would say, probably wealthiest families in Zagreb in Croatia, like having horses to do the dressing or I don't know, he graduated from two universities in the beginning of the 20th century, which was quite rare back then. And you know, his life had even more extreme twists. From being from one of the most privileged families in that country back then, he ended up in a concentration camp. He survived, he's one of the few survivors. I was running away from Serbian rockets. I was basically, my family was running away from Croatian army. And, you know, I ended up being here with a family. And, you know, I ended up even giving an advice to U.S. Congress. And now, put the things into perspective and put how the society went. Yes, there are turning points. But, you know, the whole thing goes better and better. In a sense, you know, I'm a descendant of the concentration camp prisoner to being a professor at the German universities. You couldn't get a higher contrast than that. Now, but you know, this is not my personal property. The whole world moves like this. If you look tulip mania, if you look South Sea bubble where Isaac Newton basically lost all of his belongings to the dot-com bubble. And we even see similarities to this event nowadays. You might think, then the, the reasonable question is, did we get smarter? Well, look at this chart. This chart was taken yesterday. But yesterday, a company called Online PLC change the name to online blockchain PLC. This is what happened with the stock price. <laughs> now, but look, this is not a new phenomena. If you have been long enough on this planet, you would know the Journal of Finance paper published in 2001 called Rose.com by any other name. It was in a dot-com bubble, you would change your name from, let's say, a rose to rose.com. You just add dot-com. On average, overnight, basically, or over the next 10 days, your shares will gain 74% in value. Now, what do I want to say with all this? Well, you know, we have seen many, many crises in our history. And some people, you know, in, in all this euphoria, even though we have seen crisis, it's not the first crisis, we are moving up. And you know, some people would say, let's revert to socialism, capitalism has failed. I mean, when you put it in a whole picture, you know, it's just a little bump that took place in 2008. The same thing in a personal life. Yeah, you know, on average it gets better. Of course, 
your attention gets drawn to very personal examples and you remember very bad personal examples, but on average, you know, we are getting better and better. Poverty has decreased constantly, basically, since we track it or since we are able to measure it. Wars are less and less. Of course, there will be single examples that will look bad, that will look better if you look back first, like NASA. National Agency of Space basically became, you know, we went from a state where we had a flight to moon, then we had a space shuttle and orbital flight, and then we have basically nothing. But that doesn't mean that the whole society has moved backwards. In other words, NASA, get your, get your act together. I would end here.